Greetings once again, AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School, and we're going to take a look at our final video from topic 4.2, talking about connecting position velocity and acceleration for straight line motion. And in this particular problem, we're going to go back to the moon, and we're actually going to look at a question that maybe doesn't lend itself very well to appearing on the advanced placement exam, because it does involve a falling object out of the sky, which we all know that is subject to gravity. We won't see those questions on the AP Calc exam. You're very likely to see those on an AP Physics exam, of course. But I think it kind of solidifies some of the same concepts that we've talked about with horizontal straight line motion. So let's take a look at this example seven. It says that um, we, we've got an object, of course, that's falling vertically. And, and when that happens out in nature, uh, we are going to be subjected to gravity. And, and basically what that means is that we have a, a, an array of formulas that we can use. And, and, and in large part, these might be formulas that we would have to memorize going into the problem. And it all starts right here with the position. And we, we might have uh, units that are measured in feet. Maybe we're dealing with a metric system and we'll use meters in this case. But you can see that the only difference between the two setups is the initial coefficient of the t squared, right? Those two numbers are both one half of the gravitational constant, which is either negative 32 feet per second squared or negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And from there, you just simply take the derivative a couple of times to get to your position to get to your acceleration. And I think we talked a little bit in the past, uh, if you've seen some of my other videos, about what the meanings are of the VO in each of the equations. And it turns out it's named V sub O for a reason, and that it would be the initial velocity of that object. Um, if it's thrown or dropped, will make a big difference in how that equation is set up. And then, of course, the SO is going to be our initial position. And that can be a variety of things, depending on if you're standing on a building, uh, on a cliff and dropping something, or if you're just standing on the surface and dropping. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at our example seven and see if we can make a little bit of sense of this. It says we've got a rock that's thrown vertically upward from the surface of the moon at a velocity of 24 meters per second, and it reaches a height that's given by S of t equal negative 0.8 t squared plus 24 t meters in t seconds. Now, we notice that initially this does not have a plus SO, so we're saying that this doesn't have really an initial position per se, which kind of is like, well, how do you throw a rock up when there's no height to start with? Who knows? Maybe we're laying on our back and we're conducting some kind of an experiment on the moon in our spacesuit, but I wouldn't read a whole lot into that. Let's take the S of t equation that's given to us and we'll go with it. I want you to note that this is a calculator active problem which will really require the calculator for a couple of parts but I'm going to try to do as much of this without a calculator as I can uh, with you all. So for part a find the rocks velocity and acceleration as a function of time. So what we're going to do here is we are going to break out our good friend the velocity equation v of t which we know to be the derivative of the position. And so you just simply take the derivative of negative 0.8t squared plus 24t, and with a little bit of thinking, you get negative 1.6t to the first plus 24. It's probably likely that you're getting pretty good at taking derivatives of polynomials by now. If we move one more step and take the acceleration, well, you could think of that as the derivative of the velocity, or if you really want to go further, it's the second derivative of position. And when we take that derivative, we get our negative 1.6, our familiar friend, which actually is the gravitational constant on the moon. And there's no reason to be concerned about, well, why is these two numbers different here? Um, be because they're two different situations. These values that are in this table do correspond to things that are happening on the earth and we are obviously on the moon here 
So if we look at part B, this is where kind of the, the, the special questions are coming into play. How long will it take for this rock to reach its highest point? So we're saying we throw this thing up in the air and we're thinking, thinking, hey, you know, when is this thing going to reach its highest point? Well, this is the same exact question as saying, when will this rock turn around? Because what goes up must come down, right? Galileo worked on that quite a bit. Isaac Newton worked on that quite a bit. And we know that that's got to be a thing, right? And so when we throw a rock up in the air, we know that it's going to reach its highest point whenever the velocity is equal to zero. Because you have to stop before you come back down. And so we just simply take our velocity equation, negative 1.6t plus 24 equal to zero, and we solve that. Now you could likely solve this without the use of a calculator. Um, it's certainly easy with a calculator, but it's good mathematics, I think, for us to kind of investigate this just a little bit. It would be nice if I did this correctly and subtracted the 24 over. That looks a little bit better. So I have two negatives that are going to cancel away. And essentially, if you think about, uh, you could multiply the top by a 0 or a 10, multiply the bottom by a 10. So I added a 0 to the top. And if you think, well, how many times does 16 go into 240? You might think about it a little bit, but I think it turns out to be 15 times. 16 times 15 is going to be our 240. And that would be our answer there in seconds. All right. Now, if we take a look at part C, now it's concerned about, well, how, how high does this ball go? Well, or this rock. Well, in this case, then we know that how high is going to be addressing the idea of position. So you want to return to this S of T, and you're going to use the answer that you got from part B, which was that 15 seconds. And you just simply plug in 15 for the T value in your S of T equation. And so you'd have something like this. Now, again, a lot of these problems are going to require a calculator. Uh, this is one of those that I wouldn't expect a student to have to do uh, with, without you know, the use of some kind of help. But I also realize that if you're watching this video, you probably know how to use a calculator. So when you enter all this, it turns out to be 180 meters. Again, I'm not so concerned about the, the physical manipulation of the technology. It's more of the setup here. Okay, for part D, how long did it take for that rock to reach half of its maximum height? So, and, and again, we're like throwing this rock up, and we know that it reaches its highest point right here. Well, we're kind of focused on, well, what would the time be when that rock reaches that X marks the spot stage there? And so we have to kind of think, well, in this instance, we're talking about a position a position that we know is defined by negative 0.8t squared plus 24t, and we want that position to equal half of that maximum height, which we know to be 90 meters. And so we just simply set this equal to 90. Now, to solve this, you've got really one alternative here. I don't think that this is going to factor really nicely. In fact, I know it does not factor. And so you're probably looking at having to set this equal to zero, and then you would use your quadratic formula. And that quadratic formula, if you remember, looks something like this. T equals negative the B value plus or minus the square root of uh, B squared, which in this case is 24 squared, minus 4 times your a value, which is negative 0.8, times your c value, which is negative 90. And then all of this would be placed above 2 times your a, which is 2 times negative 0.8. So it's pretty messy. The quadratic formula is, is chock full of a lot of icky things. But from this point on, any scientific calculator is going to be able to handle that. Those of you who might be using a CAS calculator like the TI Inspire like we have at our school, you probably could just use your solve uh, feature, math, uh, or go into menu algebra solve and just type that in. Now, 
whatever you decide to do, I will tell you that you will get two answers for this problem. You will get time to be approximately 4.433 seconds or 25.567 seconds. And I really want you to, uh, to verify that. You might even want to pause the video and make sure that you get those two times just to make sure that you're using your particular model of calculator correctly. And you shouldn't be surprised if you get two answers. And again, it all kind of goes back to the adage that what goes up must come down. So when 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 this rock or ball or whatever it is, it's a it's a ball in this or a rock, I'm sorry in this case, is thrown upward, we find out that it does reach that 90 meter mark one time and then after it hits its highest point at 180, it's going to come back down and boom, it's going to reach that mark a second time. And those are the two time values that that's going to happen. Um, the only thing I'd like to add to this is some labels. Let's put our time element, which is seconds, and you could just put an S for seconds. We would understand what that meant. All right. How long was the rock aloft? This is always a joke. The rock aloft? The rock wasn't aloft. The rock was a rock the whole time. Okay. Bad dad joke there. So what that means, how long was the rock aloft? That, that's another way of saying how long was the rock in the air? So you have to think about, okay, well, what do we know about this rock when it's no longer in the air? And again, we've talked about this on some previous videos, but this is just a matter of taking the position and just simply setting it equal to zero. If we set that position equal to zero, we're going to have everything that we need and boom, everything is all set to go. Now you remember our position equation, negative 0.8t squared plus 24t equals zero. Now, if you're solving this with a calculator, uh, that won't be bad because you could do, you could do the quadratic formula, I suppose, right? It's got a C value of zero. Um, you could use your CAS calculator and plug it in, which is kind of the easy way. I'm trying to think, what if you had to use a, um, your your brain to solve this. Could you solve this without a calculator? I think you could. It's a bit tricky, but if you factored out negative 0.8t to the first, you would be left with a positive t out of the first term. And if you think about, well, what, what would happen for the 24? Well, whenever you factor out something out of a value, you're essentially dividing that value by whatever you're factoring. So if you take 24 divided by the negative 0.8, well, if you work on this a little bit and multiply the top by 10 and multiply the bottom by 10, you'll probably see that that's just going to be a negative 30. And I already put the minus to act as the negative in there, and there would be our 30. And that turns out to be real important because when you solve each of these individually set equal to zero, you get t equals zero and t equal 30. And and you got to kind of logically conclude that, well, zero is not going to count because, of course, this rock was sort of at ground level before we threw it because we're thinking about the astronaut kind of being on their back and throwing it straight up in the air. And, and that doesn't tell us how long the rock was in the air. So we're definitely going to go with the t equal 30 here, uh, and that's going to be our answer. And then finally, find the rock's speed when it hits the surface of the moon. And what I really want my students and anyone out there to understand is that when you're calculating speed in particle motion, in pretty much any math class, calculus especially, is we think of that as the absolute value of the velocity. We're talking about the speed whenever this rock hit the surface of the moon, we just calculated that to be 30 in this case. And so this translates to the absolute value. Use your V equation from up above, which is negative 1.6 times the T, which is 30, plus the 24. And all of that is, is in absolute values, which is a good thing. Because if we were to work on this, I believe we get negative 48 plus 24. I'm just going to go ahead and 
simplify this slowly. You can verify this with a calculator. And that does in turn turn out to be the absolute value of the negative 24. But we have to disregard the negative because speed is signless. It does not have a positive. It doesn't have, well, it has a positive, but it doesn't have a negative. We don't worry about the direction, right? We're just talking about 24 speed and the units, of course, would be meters per second. So that's what this, this astronaut would be looking at from laying back, throwing that rock straight up, and then having it fall back on his chest. Hopefully not on his helmet. That could be bad, right? But anyhow, that takes care of our first, uh, our, our last example here that covers on uh, the topic of straight line motion. Again, it, it's not an AP topic in the sense that it'll be on the exam, but I do like how it reinforces some of our information from before with particles moving on a straight line. It's been a long topic 4.2. I know I'm so glad that you're able to watch some of these videos, but I'm you know, more glad that, that they might have been able to help you in some sense. So thanks for watching and we'll see you at the next video.